This is the Ramana Maharshi Self-Knowledge Satsang, a time for self-reflection and self-inquiry. Know yourself and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting this satsang. I'm a seeker like you, sharing what we love. I have been blessed with years of deep teaching. I bring this to you in this satsang. The background image today is Pavla Kunru. This photo is when Carol and I visited Pavla Kunru with our teacher Nomi in 2005. The Pavala Kanru Temple is dedicated to Ardhananda Shwara, the androgynous form of the Lord as half Shiva and half Parvati. It is here in this place that Parvati performed tapas to regain the favor of her Lord Shiva. He then appeared to her and absorbed her into himself, and thus the two became one. This is how Ardhanandeshwara was born. There are not many temples in India dedicated solely to Ardhanandeshwara, and this is a rare and special place, though relatively unknown. Now, its connection with Ramana started after Ramana's uncle, Nelayapa Iyer, found him while Ramana stayed in the mango tree orchard after his stay at Guru Merton Temple. The uncle tried his best to take his nephew along with him back to his mother, but the young sage would not respond. He didn't show any sign of interest in the visitor. So the uncle went back, disappointed, and conveyed the news to Alagamal, Ramana's mother. In 1898, the mother went to Tiruvannamalai, accompanied by her eldest son, Nagaswami. Ramana was then living at Pavalakandru at this place. With tears in her eyes, Alagamal entreated her son to go back with her. But for the sage, there was no going back. Nothing moved him, not even his mother's tears. He kept silent and sat still. A devotee who had been observing this struggle with his mother for several days requested Ramana to write out at least what he had to say. The sage wrote on a piece of paper these words. The ordainer controls the fate of souls in, a in accordance with their past deeds. Whatever is destined not to happen will not happen. Try how hard you may. Whatever is destined to happen will happen. Do what you may to stop it. This is certain. The best course, therefore, is to remain silent. With a heavy heart, the mother went back. Sometime after this event, Ramana started to live in different caves on the slopes of Arunachala, 
looking for a place where he would not be bothered. Now here are some photos that Carol that Carol and I took. We took many of these photos, not all. We took them on our visit to this place in 2009. <coughs> we first visited here when we traveled with Nomi and a group of devotees in January 2005. It's that visit that this photo is from. I'm the guy in the hat sitting next to Nomi in white. I have a mustache, but no beard at that time. Now, here are some photos of Pavla Kanru. First is Ardhanandashwara, the half Shiva, half Parvati. This is a traditional image and shows here the merging of Shiva and Parvati. This photo is an aerial view of Pavala Kanru with the city in the background. We didn't take this photo. This is the oldest picture of Ramana and his mother. I think this was a few years after. Now, these are our pictures. This was walking up the many steps to the temple. Uh, the temple is in Taravanamali, but really separate from it on a hill that rises uh, many steps in the air. This is the temple itself. And from the temple, this is Aranachala. Uh, the houses that we see in the foreground were certainly not there in Ramana's day. This is the big temple, Aranachala Shwara, from Pavala Kanru. On the side of the hill, uh, to the right of the tree, there is this forested area, and uh, in this is where uh, Skant Ashram was, and at the clump, the highest clump is where Skanta Ashram was. Virapaksha Cave was a little lower on this hill. And this is uh, a bigger version of the picture of Nomi and the group visiting this place in 2005. I hope you enjoyed the pictures. And now on to this week's reading from Who Am I? This is paragraph 33, 32, and Ramana's words. It is an unwise person who acts thus, meaning going into and out of the shade, whereas the wise man never leaves the shade. In the same way, the mind of an enlightened sage a yani never exists apart from Brahman, the absolute. The mind of the ignorant, on the other hand, entering into the phenomenal world, suffers pain and anguish, and then turning for a short while towards Brahman, it experiences happiness. Such is the mind of the ignorant. Now, I have been told 
that there are three ways to gain Ramana's self-realization. By self-inquiry, like Ramana did, by devotion or surrender, or by self-abidance. It is this self-abidance that Ramana talks about here. The wise person, Ramana says, never leaves the shade. The sage never leaves the bliss of the self. The mind of the ignorant is attached to the world and the body and all that these imply. These attachments bring pain, suffering, fear, etc., except for those few moments in which a desire is met, the mind quiets, and the bliss of being is experienced as worldly happiness. The most that the ignorant can hope for is periods of inner peace mixed with periods of anguish. We love these moments of peace. Ramana tells us to just stay in this peace. Sages talk about the continuous bliss of being. As long as one holds to the mind and the re mind as real, nothing will be continuous. The mind is never continuous. It just flits from one thing to another. The message is to move past the ups and downs of the mind and body and senses and ego into what is changeless within yourself. Some ideas for practice. What is your actual experience right now? Is it bliss? or something else. Remember a moment of bliss or a moment of happiness. Where does this bliss come from? What now at this moment seems to separate you from this bliss? Now, on to our videos for the week. First is from a Sarva Priyananda, and this is an excerpt from a longer talk, The Two Birds. The reference is to the Mundaka Upanishads. The Upanishads we know are the core texts of Vedanta. And in the Mundaka Upanishads, uh, in the Mundaka Upanishad, one of the most ancient of the Upanishads, in the third chapter, 3.1.1 and 3.1.2, we find this thing described using the, the uh, metaphor of the two birds and the tree. The original verses, the mantras go like this. I'll chant them out for you in the old Vedic Sanskrit, and then I'll translate, and then we'll go into it. So it goes something like this. Dva suparna sayuja sakhaya Samanam riksham parishaswajate Tayoranya pippalam swadvati Anashnan nanyo abhichakashiti Samanam riksham purusho nimagno Anishaya shochati mihyamana Yushtam yada pasyatyanyamisham Asya Mahimanam Miti Vita Shoka. Very poetic. What does it mean? There's a tree. And on this tree, there are two birds. The lower bird 
and the higher bird. And what the lower bird does is, it hops from branch to branch and looks at different uh, fruits and pecks at one and finds it sweet, eats it up, looks for another one, pecks it, that's a little bitter, gets a little taken aback, tries to eat something else, eating bitter and sweet fruits like this until it comes to a particularly bitter fruit and getting the shock of its life, it stops eating for a while, takes a step back, looks up and sees the higher bird. The higher bird sitting somewhere up there, quietly, not hopping around from branch to branch and not chasing the fruits, not eating this fruit or that fruit. Anashnan, not consuming. It just abhijakashit, it watches. It just shines there. The higher bird, peaceful, calm, unchanging. And the lower bird looking up at that thinks, that's wonderful. And it gets attracted towards it and hops up towards the higher bird. But then what <coughs> happens as it happens? It sees another particularly attractive fruit. Okay, higher bird can wait, it's there. Let me just take a look at this. And eats it and finds it sweet, it's nice. And forgets the higher bird. And then goes from fruit to fruit until it gets another shock and looks up at the higher bird, makes some more progress towards it. And that's the story of our spiritual lives really. We are attracted. And who wouldn't really want to be a saint? You know, want to be a saint. But only without the trouble that goes with it. Uh, it is, there's a saying in ancient Sanskrit which says that uh, everybody wants the result of good karma, but they don't want to do the good karma. Everybody wants to enjoy the sin, but they don't want the bad karma that comes from the sin. <laughs> so this is how the little bird, it hops from, from fruit to fruit and forgets the higher bird. But ultimately it gets such a terrible shock one day, maybe something, the death of a beloved person or one's own imminent death, a, a fatal disease has come up and such a big shock, a particularly really bitter fruit and then it sort of withdraws from that life of pecking and seeking and tasting this or that and now moves deliberately towards the higher bird purposefully. And finally, when it comes closer to the higher bird, something strange happens. The lower bird begins to get transformed. It sees that it's more and more like the higher bird. The higher bird, which is described as golden and shining. Superna, golden and shining. And the lower bird also begins to see itself as that, radiant in the light of the higher bird. And in the end, lo and behold, the lower bird sees itself as the higher bird. There is no lower bird at all. And in fact, there never was. This is the game of Maya. There never was the lower bird. It was the higher bird all along, dreaming the life of the lower bird. So the higher bird alone, alone remains. So that's as far as the, the metaphor goes. And it's a beautiful way, poetic way of explaining life, spirituality, spiritual seeking, the culmination of spirituality, the path of spiritual progress, all of that, you find it so beautifully in this example. Come on up here, there, there, are, there are chairs here. Come, come, come. But today what we will do is, we will take a closer look at this. Let's take the time available to us and go in depth into this, go deeper into this. What is the tree and what is the lower bird and what is the higher bird and how does it relate to our lives? How does it explain the whole of Vedanta? That's what we're going to do this morning. Um, the menu is very rich in front of us now. So, um, Vedanta is the science of the human being in depth. This is what Swami Ranganathan used to say. The science of the human being in depth who are we really in our deepest nature, in our real nature? That's what Vedanta seeks to investigate. And it start, starts with the most obvious, uh, most apparent 
fact of our, our personality, the body. So the first component that we have to look at is, here is the body. And in this example, in the higher bird, lower bird example, the two birds example, the body is compared to a tree. Tree, this is the tree in which there is man and there is God. There is the lower bird and there is the higher bird. Sri Ramakrishna is to say, within this there are two. There is the divine mother and her child, the devotee. In this body, he is to say, right here, there are two. Um, so, the physical body, that's that's the first component of the human personality. In this particular example in the Upanishad, it is compared to the tree. As we go deeper into the physical body, as we look inside, we find what is called a subtle body. Physical body in Sanskrit, sthula shariram. Subtle body in Sanskrit, sukshma shariram. As we go inside, we find a subtle body. Remember, the subtle body is nothing theoretical, nothing that you have to believe in, no, no, um, no theoretical construct. It's something that we experience. Physical body, here it is. Subtle body, look inside. Thoughts, emotions, feelings. Physical body, I can show you. Here's the hand. My thoughts or my memory or my intellect, I cannot show it to you physically. But for me, the subject within, it's a first person experience. I can directly experience, all of us experience our own thoughts, our memories, our feelings. In fact, we experience it most vividly. Come, come, there are chairs here, up ahead. Come, come. Here. So the subtle body is something that we experience. In Vedanta, the subtle body is analyzed into having no less than 17 components. None of them something that you have to believe in or theoretical. I'll just point them out to you and you'll say, yes, it's true, it's there. What are the 17 components? Um, the five sense organs, our uh, organs of sight, the eyes and hearing, the ears and taste, the tongue and the skin, which enables us to touch and feel and the nose, which gives us the sense of smell. So five sense organs, that's five. And the five motor organs, uh, the organs of uh, of the hands, the, the legs, the organs of locomotion, organ of speech, reproduction, and elimination. So the five motor organs, that makes ten. And the prana, the life forces within us, that which is responsible for the physiological processes which keep this body alive, breathing, blood circulation, assimilation of food, conversion of food into the physical body and into energy. All of this, the physiological processes going on in this body, they are powered by what is called prana. In Sanskrit, prana. In Chinese, they call it chi. Uh, so prana, the life forces. It's like, the, like a battery pack, which keeps this system going. The engine, the powerhouse. And in, uh, in Vedanta, the prana, the life forces, are analyzed into five different functions. Prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana. Each of them uh, physiological functions which are clearly identified. We need not go into the details, but five are there. Five functions of the prana. So they are called the pancha prana. How many do we have so far? Fifteen. The five sense organs, the five motor organs, the five pranas. Remember, when we speak about sense organs or motor organs, we are not actually speaking of the physical eyes or the physical ears, because physical eyes and ears are parts of the physical body. That's already in the physical body, sthula sharira. In, now we are in the subtle body, sukshma sharira. These are the powers, the functions which work through these physical organs. So five sense organs, five motor organs, and the five uh, pranas, pancha prana. We have 15. And two more. The mind, thoughts, emotions, and the intellect, that which we are using to understand all this, the intellect, the understand capacity for uh, cognition, understanding. So the intellect and the mind, buddhi and manas, that makes 17. Each of these 17 is nothing new. Vedanta is not telling us anything new here. Vedanta is just labeling just identifying these 17 components, which we all should say, yes, I have those. Here, 
Uh, in classical Vedanta, sometimes you find the, the inner instrument, antakkarana, analyzed into four parts. The mind, the intellect, the ego, and the memory. Mana, buddhi, ahankara, and chitta. So if you make four parts, then the total becomes 19. If you just make two, mind and intellect, the total becomes 17. Whatever, 19 or 17, basically it is a subtle body. The difference between the subtle body and the physical body being, the physical body is, is perceivable. You can see it. And it's public. But I can see it, you can see it also. But the subtle body is experienced by me or by you directly within as a first person experience. Nobody else can experience the subtle body unless the person is a telepath who can read your thoughts. Other than that, your subtle body is visible to you, the consciousness. Now, that's not the end of the story. Subtle body is there, and Vedanta says deeper than that, Vedanta speaks of something called the causal body, karana sharira. Stula sharira, physical body, here. Sukshma sharira, subtle body, inside us. First person we directly experience. Deeper than that, Vedanta speaks of a, another body, body within quotes, karana sharira, causal body. What is this causal body? Again, nothing theoretical. It's what we experience in deep sleep. When you go to sleep, in deep sleep, you do not experience your physical body. You do not experience the world outside. You do not experience the physical body. You do not even experience the mind. No thoughts. In dreams, at least, the mind is experienced because the mind creates a dream world. But when there are no dreams, deep sleep, mind is also not experienced. Even I am sleeping, this I, the ego, that is also not experienced. That blankness, the state of blankness, that is called the causal body, uh, the karana sharira. That is actually in Vedanta the ignorance, the causal ignorance which hides our true nature from us. So that is the karana sharira, the causal body. What do we have so far? So far? We have the physical body which is compared to the tree in this uh, mantra and then we have the subtle body of 17 parts and we have the causal body and in this subtle body and causal body there is an awareness there is an awareness right now we feel sentient we feel aware not only do we have thoughts but we are aware of our thoughts we feel an intelligence and awareness a consciousness in this body and mind that awareness sentience which we feel right now that is not pure consciousness which Vedanta will speak about, but that is the reflected consciousness. That is called Chidabhasa, reflected consciousness. So if we have one more thing, a fourth component called the Chidabhasa, reflected consciousness. And if there is a reflected consciousness, there must be the original, the one which is being reflected, which is called the witness consciousness. Pure consciousness, witness consciousness, that do come, there is a chair here. So now we have five factors, five elements. What are the five elements? One is the physical body. One is the subtle body with 17 parts. One is the causal body, the ignorance of the darkness which hides our real nature from us. And one is the awareness reflected in the, in the causal and subtle bodies. The awareness, the sentience which we feel right now, the chidabhas or reflected consciousness. And finally, the point of all of this, the higher bird, is the pure consciousness or what Vedanta would call the witness consciousness, sakshi. In Sanskrit, sthula sharira, sukshma sharira, karana sharira, chidabhasa, sakshi. That's quite a list. But at least the first four, the first four, we should be able to identify straight away. Right now, while sitting here, we should be able to understand, identify. Here is the physical body. Look inside. Yes, here is the subtle body. My breathing, prana. My thoughts, the mind, sense organs, motor organs, the subtle body. Beyond that, if you try to think beyond thought, you run up against a blank wall. Right now, without going into deep sleep, that blankness beyond thought is the causal body. 
Karana Sharira. And the awareness which is shining through all of this, Jidabhasa, reflected consciousness. And Vedanta says, right here, there is something called a witness consciousness. Pure consciousness or witness consciousness, Sakshi Chaitanya. That witness consciousness, now let's fit it into the example which of, of the two birds. The body is, of course, the tree. And that witness consciousness, which Vedanta speaks about, that is not yet clear to us, evident to us, or not known to us yet. If it is known, you're lucky. You don't need to attend this talk. <laughs> but that is, according to Vedanta, that's what we truly are. Come, come. So, according to Vedanta, that uh, witness consciousness is what we truly are. And the lower bird, that's the interesting part. What is the lower bird in this structure, in this five uh, component structure of the human personality? The lower bird is the, the intermediate three. Body is the tree. And the lower bird is the subtle body, the causal body, and the reflected consciousness. Subtle body, causal body, reflected consciousness. Remember, the moment we speak about the reflected consciousness, the witness consciousness is also implied. Moment you speak about moonlight, the presence of the sun is also implied, though we don't see it. Because without the sun, there's no moonlight. The mo moment you speak about our reflection, my reflected face in the mirror, the original face is also implied because without the original face, nothing would be reflected there. So when we speak about a reflected consciousness, which we are aware of right now, which we are using right now, and in Vedanta, it's always helpful to ground what is being said in our personal experience. So what we are experiencing right now and what I'm saying from here, they're not two different things. I'm just labeling at every step, see if it corresponds with, with the, what we are experiencing. So the awareness which we have right now in this body and mind, that reflected consciousness, it means the pure consciousness or witness consciousness is present right now. Otherwise, what is being reflected? So the lower bird is this one. The subtle body, causal body, reflected consciousness, and witness consciousness implied. Higher bird is the witness consciousness alone. So now the picture is complete. Now what happens? The lower bird feels conscious and has a mind and an intellect and the sense organs and is in this body and fully identified with this body. Now it sees these fruits hanging all around, good and bad. And it does not know itself in its perfect nature, finds itself imperfect subject to disease and old age and death and so forth. And it wants completion by the experience of things. It sees itself as an experiencer. I have eyes. I am consciousness with a mind and an eyes and ears. So I can see things, I can hear things. I have tongue, I can taste things. And each of these experiences is giving me some kind of joy or sometimes misery. So it becomes what is called in Sanskrit, bhokta, experiencer. Who becomes the bhokta experiencer? The lower bird. Because it is that reflected consciousness with the sense organs. It also becomes karta, the doer. The lower bird becomes a doer, an agent of action. Because it has got hands and legs and tongue. I can grasp things. I can use my legs to walk around. I've got a tongue to speak. So I do actions. So the lower bird is a karta and bhokta, a doer and an experiencer. Sometimes bhokta is, trans is translated as enjoyer. But enjoyer not, does not quite capture the whole thing. Most of our experiences are not very enjoyable. Uh, usually it's a mixture of enjoyment and misery. So, he That's what we have for the two birds at this time. 
we will listen to the rest of the talk at a later date. Next is Rupert Spira, and he's talking about the simplicity of self-abidance. I have a question um, about the um, relaxing of attention and abiding as the self in order to recognize and familiarize myself with that. If I understand it correctly, and I guess that's the question, um, relaxing the attention from objects, but myself is qualityless, so attention can't attach to it. Do I understand correctly that then there is no attention and the mind has no role to play in this? Yes, attention means awareness directed towards an object. So awareness cannot attend to itself. It cannot pay attention to itself because there is nothing objective there to pay attention to. But for the same reason that the eyes cannot see themselves because they are too close to themselves, there is no distance from your eyes to your eyes. So the eyes cannot see themselves. You cannot attend to yourself because you can only attend to something that is at a distance from yourself. So as the uh, attention sinks, as it were, inwards, it, it loses its limitations. So, and, and when you go all the way back to awareness, awareness cannot know itself or does not know itself in subject-object relationship. I think there's a kind of a struggle that my mind is still involved in trying to understand or or to uh, to bring together the 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 relaxing of attention at first seems like an action uh, as opposed to the cessation of an action okay so it's just a relaxing that helps not paying attention to anything objective and there remains a sense of, I guess, still having to do something. I think that's getting in the way. Is that part? If you ask yourself a question such as, what is it that knows or is aware of my experience? <coughs> what happens to your mind? It fades. Is that fading an effort of your mind? No, that's that's exactly a cessation of activity. Yes, so this question is a very powerful question because it the mind cannot find the answer to that question well, okay. in any object of experience because you would immediately ask the question again, but what is it that knows or is aware of this object? I, I think I, said, I suddenly realized, I don't, I don't know if this makes sense, but w uh, the cessation leads to something that's always there. Yes, or even more direct than this question, ask yourself the question, am I aware? Same thing. What happens to your mind then? Um, it needs to fade, or at least be somehow bypassed yes in order to answer the question am i aware in order to answer yes to the question am i aware we have to go directly to the experience of being aware but we don't have to go there we are the experience of being aware so being aware becomes aware of being aware being aware of being aware so could it be as simple as that all of this mind activity self-referential thought and stuff is exactly the thing that draws us away. It just has to stop and we're home. That's how it seems. Does that yes. make sense? Yes. Is it seriously, is it that simple? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, what is it that remains when the activity of the mind? ceases. Me. What is it that remains when you turn the movie off? The screen. 
when everything that can be removed from you is removed from you, what remains? The essential you. The essential irreducible you. <coughs> Don't go looking for that. You cannot find it. It is too close to you. No, I, uh, I, I see that. I you, see that. you can only be that knowingly. Yeah. yeah. And we are already that, but most of us are that unknowingly, without recognizing it. So, uh, awareness, we, I, awareness, has dreamed this experience within itself, located itself in this body in order to perceive that dream. And in doing so, has shrunk itself into the frame, the temporary local frame of a body. And it feels imprisoned. It, it, it longs to go back to its fullness, to its wholeness, to its, to, its, um, to its natural condition. I don't mean to suggest that it's unnatural to manifest the world. I mean to its original condition. But its original condition is not something that is foreign to it. It's not, it's not at a distance from yourself. You are always only infinite consciousness. But you have lost yourself in your own dream. So, it's not even true to say you have to go back to yourself as if you have left yourself. No, your own dream takes place within yourself. You have veiled yourself with yourself. You, consciousness, have veiled yourself with your own creativity and lost yourself in your own creativity, but you have never ceased being yourself. And the funny thing, it's all one thing at the same time. Yes, you, you, your own creativity is, is, is only yourself, yeah. is only yeah. a play of yourself. So self-inquiry is a kind of unveiling of consciousness. Consciousness veils itself with its own activity. And what we call self-inquiry or meditation or prayer is the unveiling of consciousness and rev and, until it, it, it stands revealed as it essentially is. And, and the, the hint in each of our finite minds of consciousness as it is, is the knowledge I am. That, that is, a, the knowledge I am is a trace that God has left in each of our hearts to remind us of his presence. So that is why the thought, I, it's why Ramana Maharshi's version of self-inquiry was the question, who am I? It's why Nisargadatta's formulation of self-inquiry was focus on the I am. Take the thought, I, go to the experience to which you refer when you say, I am. That is a, a, a portal, as it were. It, it is the means by which the mind is gradually divested of its limitations and stands revealed as infinite consciousness. why I am is said to be God's name, God's presence in our hearts, the light of consciousness shining in each of our finite minds. That light of consciousness is accessed through the knowledge I am. That's one of the ways. It is also the knowing that pervades the entire mind. So it's not just a, a portal. You could also take the knowing. God's presence is the knowing that pervades all experience. That is infinite consciousness shining not just in the background of our finite experience, but amidst, in the midst of our finite experience. And then we have Nomi talking about steady knowledge of yourself. The indestructibility of the knowledge of truth lies in our identity with it. The truth which is being, existence itself, is innately imperishable. It is unborn or uncreated, and it never comes to an end. Our identity with that is the essential knowledge. When I say our identity, I mean it only loosely. 
For there is no no hour or multiplicity in the real self. Multiplicity is only imagined, a product of delusion, while existence itself is indivisible. If there is ignorance prevailing regarding that existence, the real self, then we may imagine the very same thing as many. If we are more spiritually inclined, we will think of one being in the many. If we take a still higher view, we will think of many in the one. But if we know ourselves as we are, it is indivisible. Just one self, one existence, which is simultaneously of the nature of perfect bliss and consciousness. The knowledge of identity, of what we are, is what is essential. So the Maharshi's instruction is consistently one of self-knowledge. And the advice for spiritual practice is to deeply inquire as to, within yourself, who am I? If we misidentify or become attached to that which is perishing, that which is mutable, then the steadiness of knowledge of the self or self-realization will seem elusive. We will connect that which is innate with some bodily state or some mental state. But if we know ourselves as we are, beyond what is changeful, transcendent over definition by the body, by the mind, or even as an individual entity or ego, then we find the realization, the knowledge of truth, innately steady. Knowledge of the truth, therefore, or of the absolute, is really knowledge of yourself. How could one not know himself? Is there some distance, some chasm between yourself and yourself? Sri Bhagavan says, is there one, two, are there two selves, one to know another? Again, he says, I know myself. I do not know myself. Both statements are a matter for laughter. If there is the conception, yet I don't see myself. I listen to this, but I don't know myself as I am. I don't know myself as that. Inquire as to what is the nature of this I? does not know. Is that I a body? Is the I thoughts? Who is it that it says, I experience or I know a body, my thoughts, the world and such? If you go on inquiring like this deeply within yourself, the misidentification with what is unreal ceases. Even individuality itself, the notion, I am some kind of ego, some kind of entity, to which all the other definitions are appended. Even that being unreal vanishes. 
what remains is perpetual existence, which is unborn and which does not have an end. That is what you are. The silent abidance in your true nature is the entire teaching. All other explanations are merely auxiliary argument. So now we'll take a few minutes for meditation and breathe in and out. Notice the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. Take long, slow breaths. Just notice that you are aware. You are aware and you know you are aware. Now inquire, investigate within yourself, within your actual experience right now. What within me is the witness of all? Who or what knows all of this? Am I ever anything else but that, but that witness other than this knowing consciousness? Who am I? What? is my identity. What is the nature of myself? All right. Now let's close with a short chant. Om Shanti 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 Om Peace, peace, peace. Now, if this satsang was of interest to you, I have more, a free book site, a YouTube site, and my blog. The URLs will be on the screen next. And these satsangs will continue in the coming weeks with this series based on the Ramana Maharshi book, 
who am I? Thank you for letting me share this teaching with you.